Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us for part two of the three part on the level series. We're happy to introduce practical solutions for selecting and installing exterior insulation with our host, Josh Salinger today. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Bear with me. There you go. I'm Ali Kello, Spencer Training Development Lead for Earth Advantage. I assist Earth Advantage in programs, curriculum development, and here to support participants with inquiries along the way and how to achieve their CEs and certificates. Next slide. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to thank our partners at Better Built Northwest for generally, uh, generously supporting this training. Next slide. Here is a screenshot of the Better Built Northwest website, where you can find a wide variety of trainings, tools, resources to both support code and above code building, as well as a directory that will help you search for a zip code to find an energy rater, utility incentive program, certification program, and other professionals in your local area. Overall, Better Built Northwest is an excellent resource. We encourage you to take a look. Next slide. So I'd like to start off by letting people know that this is one of the three part on the level series offered by Earth Advantage's new Sustainable Homes Professional Online course. These recorded live webinars recreate the same in-depth experience as the in-person SHP class, but now SHP is available on demand and through the comfort of your own home. The on level series is just one of the many content benefits when enrolling in SHP. We'll talk more about the Sustainable Homes Professional Training at the end of this session. So now I would like to introduce our instructor, Josh Salinger. Josh Salinger is the founder and CEO of Bird's Mouth Design Build in Portland, Oregon. Bird's Mouth is a residential design build firm focused on addressing climate change through the built environment, uh, through zero energy homes and deep energy uh, retrofits. He's an instructor for both Earth Advantage's Sustainable Homes Professional course, as well as FIAS Certified Passive House Builder Training Program. He sits on the board of the Passive House Northwest and also sits on the technical committee of the Zero Energy Ready Oregon. Additionally, he is a EBA Zero Energy Home Professional and an expert member on the Green Builder Advisor and contributes content to the Fine Home Building Magazine. A lot of the content that you're getting today is exactly for his next article. Uh, Bird's Mouth was recently introduced into Earth Advantage's Green Builder Hall of Fame. And he has earned Earth Advantage's awards for Zero Energy Builder of the Year, Lowest Energy Trust, uh, uh, Trust of Oregon EPS of the Year 2018, and Earth Advantage's Custom Builder of the Year in 2020. So Josh is going to be sharing some of the science behind using exterior insulation, along with some proven techniques for choosing and installing various materials so you can take your projects to the next level of performance. So thank you so much for joining us today, Josh. Cool, thank you, Ali, and hello, everybody. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about uh, exterior insulation. So the, these are the five things that we're all trying to do with our homes. And so this whole presentation, whether we're talking about exhalate, you know, exhalation is one word for exterior insulation, uh, or we're talking about building science, or we're talking about high-performance building. What we're trying to do is these things. These are the five things, the six things, that we are trying to deliver to our clients and to create a really good uh, built environment. So we're doing it so that we have healthy uh, buildings. We wanna make them comfortable for our clients, for the people that live in them. They need to be durable, right? Um, I've said this before, any knucklehead can build a zero energy house, but make it last for a hundred years or make it so that it has good indoor air quality, make it so that it's comfortable. Those are the things that we are endeavoring to do. So durability, really important. Uh, savings, that's uh, financial savings because you're not you know, paying uh, those energy bills if you're able to uh, create all that energy that you need on site, right? So that's that zero energy thing. Uh, obviously they're sustainable. That's what uh, you know, my main focus is with what I'm doing. And they need to be resilient, right? They need to be able to keep people comfortable and safe 
during power outages, during earthquakes. Uh, if there's wildfire smoke, we need to be able to deliver healthy air inside of these buildings. And that's uh, you know, what we're trying to do with our buildings is these six things. So everything that we're gonna talk about today is gonna come back to these. So uh, I'm gonna start off just with some of the uh, energy code stuff. Uh, we'll go through Oregon and Washington, but there's a really great resource here uh, from NIA, Earth Advantage worked with them to, um, to kind of give you a quick summary of the changes to the energy efficiency and mechanical chapters of the or Oregon code. Um, so this is a really great document. Um, the link is here. Uh, Earth Advantage will be recording this and putting these slides up. So if you need to get this link, you can go here to make sure that you're staying on top of all the latest adopted Oregon codes. Um, specifically for 2021, the Oregon Adopted Residential Specialty Code, uh, exhalation, uh, exterior insulation does come up uh, in the code in the additional measures. So in this table, as you go through and you're, you're clicking off all of your energy efficiency measures that you need to provide in order to get your permit, uh, you have to choose additional measures. This is one of them. Uh, number three were the exterior walls with conventional framing with R5 continuous insulation. So this is starting to get into our codes. And I imagine in the next code cycle adoption, we're going to see more and more of this. I imagine in two code cycle adoptions, this is going to become very common practice. Um, for those of you in the state of Washington, um, you know, the WSU's energy program is a really good one-stop shop for trainings, resources, and technical support. Again, the link is at the bottom of the slide and we'll share those with you. Um, specifically in Washington, um, you know, here you get points that you have to um, get a certain amount of credits, they call them, and exterior insulation in various different formats, whether it's R4, R12, or R16, will give you more or less points that you can add to your total. So uh, these credits are available under the current Washington Energy Code for exterior insulation. So up in Washington, a little ahead of Oregon, um, this stuff's really coming into play quite a bit. So uh, with that, I'm gonna just kind of do a really quick review of some of the uh, just basics of building science, right? So first law of thermodynamics, you know, energy be can be transformed, uh, but it cannot be created nor destroyed. And for our purposes, the second law of thermodynamics is the really important one, right? So over time, differences in temperature, pressure, and chemical potential tend to even out in the physical system that's isolated from the outside world. So our homes create a boundary between the inside and the universe, right? So we're, we want to pay attention to those energy, pressure, or chemical flows that are happening across that boundary is what we're going to be pay, paying attention to. So um, the basic principles, warm goes to cold, right? Everything wants to even out. Um, more goes to less. So if you have high pressures or you have high concentrations, it's going to go from high uh, or from more concentrations to, to lower concentration. And then the last one is uh, gravity. Things are gonna go from high down to low, right? So basic principles that we're gonna revisit throughout this whole presentation here. So click forward here. Bear with me a second here. There we go. Um, so with any assembly, and we're gonna talk about this quite a bit, um, there are four goals that you wanna pay attention to. There is controlling bulk water, first and foremost. These are in order of uh, importance here. You wanna make sure we're not getting rain into the house, right? The second thing is we're gonna control air movement. So this is air leakage. We wanna make sure that we're controlling that air leakage through the house because air contains moisture, right? And then we want to control vapor movement. So this is diffusion of water molecules through a, um, a surface or a membrane. And then the last thing is controlling thermal movement. And exterior insulation is going to deal with all four of these things, and we'll come back to them various times throughout this presentation. So uh, with that, um, we'll kick this off. So continuous exterior insulation. Um, it's a wall assembly where a continuous layer of rigid insulation is installed on the external surface of the structural sheathing. Uh, the system provides a thermal break 
It uh, can integrate with the air barrier installation. It improves the overall wall U or R value and mitigates the condensation risks and reduces sound transmission compared to a standard wall framing assembly. And uh, this actually, this definition here came from this advanced walls document from Better Built Northwest. Uh, Ali pointed out that website earlier. I highly recommend checking that out. This is located here and I did get a bunch of this information from or for this presentation from this document right here, including that definition that they just gave. So a really good resource uh, to look back into as, as we're going. So uh, the first thing we wanna do uh, when talking about exterior insulation is defining our thermal boundary. Um, and you know, if it's a simple house, it's pretty obvious. You know, you're just gonna determine where your insulation is whether it's uh, disconnecting from the earth to the building, the walls to the outside or the ceiling to the outside. But you need to pay attention uh, because oftentimes there's garages, right? Is the garage within the thermal boundary or not? Is there a porch? Does the porch um, create a thermal bridge? Are we paying attention to our ductwork is located? Is that going into a crawl space or into a knee wall? is the knee wall uh, part of your thermal boundary. So one of the first things we wanna do when talking about exterior insulation is determining where your thermal boundary is. And you know, on a, a really simple basic house, it's pretty straightforward, but I know I've worked on a number of houses where it's not always clear. And you'll wanna spend your time thinking about where is our continuous thermal boundary and draw that out on your plan so that you know uh, that you're not giving any thermal breaks or any parts of your assembly where you don't have any insulation. So, um, you know, there's three ways that, um, that you can uh, experience thermal losses in a building. One's through radiation, one's through convection, and the last is through conduction. And we're mostly going to focus on this conduction because that's what the exterior insulation is going to be doing. It's going to be breaking that conduction, that thermal bridge through that stud to the outside universe and, and losing that heat to the universe through that conduction through the stud. By putting that layer of exterior insulation over the top of that, we're breaking that conduction. So that's the main reason that we're, um, or the main type of heat loss that exterior insulation is dealing with. So here we've got uh, a photo of, on the right of a, of a building that I took a picture of just real close to my house, maybe four blocks away. This was maybe about three years ago, a new building. And you can see here, you can see every single stud every header, every rim joist on this entire building. And this is just a really great visual of conduction happening. So you can see on the roof where you've got the frost, this was a cold day, everything frosted over, including that wall. And what happened is it's slowly losing its heat from the inside of the building to the outside. And it caused that frost to melt. And that's what we're seeing here. And then where every stud and every rim joist and cripple and all that kind of stuff is located, we're getting so much energy pumping through condu conduction from the inside of the building to the outside, that's actually drying out that moisture on the outside of the building. So what we're seeing is where the insulation is, there's still that moisture, uh, but where a stud is or a header or a rim, it's actually put so much heat through that it's dried it out. So you can see this in real time when things frost over. Uh, on the left, you can see uh, an infrared image You've probably seen things like this before, where we're seeing that there's missing insulation. We can see every one of those studs there, the top plate. And that's, again, just more of that conduction that we're seeing right there. So um, we'll talk about this exterior rigid insulation. On top right here is a, a graphic of, of essentially what's happening, where you've got your framed stud wall filled full of interior insulation. Then there's typically a sheathing. Uh, then there are your control layers where you've got your typically WRB, then you've got your exterior insulation, and then a rain screen and some siding. And we'll get that into, uh, we'll get into that a little bit further in a little bit here. And on the bottom, you can see some examples uh, of different types. On the bottom left, we've got some rock wool. Uh, the middle is a GPS insulation, which is a expanded polystyrene, otherwise known as EPS, that has some graphite impregnated into it, which makes it a little more rigid and has a slightly higher R value. On the right, there's a picture of some cork insulation, some thermal cork insulation. 
Uh, other words, terms you might hear about exterior insulation is uh, exsulation. You might, you've already heard me say that a couple times, or outsulation. So there's insulation and then outsulation. So they're all interchangeable. And as you've already noticed, you've heard me say exsulation and exterior insulation a number of times here. So um, these are some really common types of exterior insulation that are readily available on the market. Clearly there are others, um, but these are the ones we're gonna focus on today. And this probably covers about 95% of, of the most common uh, types that you're gonna see. So mineral fiber, spun rock wool, um, and the, let's see, that one is on the top right here. Uh, expanded polystyrene, that's that EPS. Um, don't have a picture of it here, but that's the stuff that looks like your uh, coffee cup with little white bubbles. Um, graphite impregnated EPS, that's that bottom middle picture there. It's that gray graphite impregnated EPS. Then there's the extruded polystyrene, which is the pink stuff. Sometimes you see it blue also. Um, there's also polyisocyanurate, which is often just called polyiso. And that comes oftentimes most commonly with like a foil facing, um, but it also comes with fiberglass facing or a paper facing. Um, then there's the wood fiberboard products, typically uh, have kind of like a wax or a paraffin impregnated in them. That's on the bottom right. And then cork is another, uh, not super common, but available material that, um, has some really nice properties to it. So um, here's a chart. We've got a bunch of charts coming up and this is typically the thing most people focus on right away when we're talking about insulation and that's the R value. Uh, you know, what is the thermal conductivity of that particular product? And as you can see here, there's ranges for all these different things from EPS uh, starting at about 3.6 and some of the polyiso cyanurate, the polyiso, getting as high as about 7.6. So um, again, these are gonna be available as slides. You can always refer back to these. Uh, things to point out here uh, is that there's ranges on some of these. So for instance, the EPS on the top goes from 3.6 to 4.2. Now, there are some small differences between manufacturers, but mostly what that's referring to is the density of that particular type of exterior insulation. So you can get a type one, type two, type nine, type 12, type 13 EPS, which is referring to the, the density or the compressivity of that particular material. As these materials get more dense, they have more of an R value per inch. They also get more expensive too. So next slide here is kind of a busy slide. There's a lot going on here, um, but Essentially what it's saying is that if you take a two by six standard wall and you have an R21 bat insulation or blown in R21 insulation in your interior of your wall assembly, um, by the time you add up all the thermal bridging and the losses that come along with that through your studs and through the headers, which in this case are taking up about 21% of that wall, um, when you factor that all together, your, your actual nominal R value is not 21, it's actually 17. And I've done a number of these calculations, and this calculation is actually pretty generous. Uh, oftentimes, with the way insulation is really installed in the real world, and the amount of framing in these walls, it can be as low as 14 or 15 or something like that for your um, overall nominal uh, insulation value. So, um, the solution really is exterior insulation, right? So this graph is showing us like a two by six wall with 16 inch on center framing with just that interior insulation is getting somewhere, you know, a 14, 16, 17 or something like that R value. But if we take that same two by six wall with the same framing, and then we put two inches of expanded polystyrene on that, well, suddenly our overall uh, our value has jumped up to 27, 37, uh, you know, pretty big. So you can see the impact that exterior insulation is having on the nominal value of those walls once you're taking into account those thermal bridging losses through that framing. So it's, it's quite impactful. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about the thermal aspects of exterior insulation. We're gonna talk about vapor next. So there are three classes of uh, vapor, and this is, we're talking about water molecules in their gaseous state um, and how those diffuse through a 
membrane, right? And so uh, class one is less than 0.1 perms. This is basically considered a vapor barrier. Um, class two goes from 0.1 to one. That is a vapor retarder along with uh, class three. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to slow down vapor transport quite a bit. Um, class three vapor retarders go from one to 10 perms. And those are going to slow things down, but it's also going to allow some drying. So it's going to retard the movement of that vapor through diffusion and slow it down, right? Whereas then if we get into something that's open, which is greater than 10 perms, those water molecules in the gaseous state are just going to travel right through it like it's not there. It's considered vapor open, right? So as we look at the chart to the right, uh, we can see that there's all these different types of uh, exterior insulation. We've got their R value, and then we've got their class in perms per inch. So you can see certain things here when you get down to mineral fiber or wood fiber board. Um, those are open. They've got 35 perms. That vapor is just going to not see it. It's like it's not there. It's just going to dry right through it. Or vapor, if you're in a hot, humid climate, is just going to come into your building and not get slowed down by that. Um, other, other things, we've got this uh, foil-faced polyisocyanurate. That's a class one. So that is a vapor barrier because it's got foil facing on it and vapor can't get through metal, right? So it's gonna stop uh, any vapor transport from happening. So as you're choosing your products and you're thinking about you know, how resilient you wanna you want make your building, and where you're located, maybe uh, your microclimate or even larger than that, are you building in Florida or are you building in Minnesota or are you building on the coast in a desert? You may choose a different vapor profile for your exterior insulation in order to be able to control vapor diffusion into and out of your building. And we'll get into like why that's important here in just a little bit. So. This is a good way to think about vapor um, and how it moves. And, and with any wall assembly, you want to go through your wall assembly and decide what part of your wall assembly is the least vapor permeable. And once we determine that, that's going to be called our vapor control layer, because that, that layer that has the least permeability is going to be the one that's really going to be slowing down or stopping those water vapor molecules as they're going through that assembly. So I like to think of it as um, you know, like a six lane highway where you got some cars and they're moving really well. You know, this is your vapor, your water, water molecules are just cruising right through that material like it's not there. But when we get to our vapor control layer and suddenly we're down to that class two vapor retarder, it's like that six lane highway just backed up down to two lanes and suddenly all those cars, all those water molecules are backing up at that point. That's where things are really slowing down, backing up. And if that happens to be cold at that point, we can get condensation. So I think this is a nice way to think about that vapor diffusion and, and how that's happening and why it's important to, to find in our wall assemblies where our vapor control layer is. And so with this diagram right here, we're taking an example where we've got a warm, humid inside air. Maybe we're at 50% relative humidity, it's 70 degrees inside, it's winter, it's cold and dry out there. And our basic principles tell us things want to go from high concentration to low. So that concentration of water vapor is going to be higher on the warm inside at 50% relative humidity than it is on the cold outside where maybe it's 28 degrees and 15% relative humidity. So those water vapor molecules are going to want to cruise to the outside and they're, they're cruising through your sheet rock your interior insulation like it's not there. Those are all vapor open. And suddenly it hits this back of the sheathing. The sheathing is probably somewhere between one to three perms. That's a class two vapor retarder. And it's going to back up. That's the six lane, six lane highway suddenly turning into two, right? So if you look at the bottom, we can see the temperature difference, right? Where it's warm on the inside, cold on the outside. On the top, we've got a little chart there with uh, permeability. It's high on the inside. It's getting lower and lower as we get to that vapor control layer. And as soon as we get past the vapor control layer, it's high again, because there's nothing there stopping it from getting out. So if it's cold enough and we're at the dew point on this uh, 
you know, the, on the temperature scale down on the bottom, and we're backing up and that vapor is backing up at that point where there's that dew point, we can get condensation, liquid water forming on the backside of that sheathing right there. And that can be dangerous if that happens quite a bit, it can cause mold, uh, rot, and durability issues with your assemblies, right? So how do we solve for that? If we add a nice thick layer of exterior insulation to the outside of that wall, everything's still the same. Let's say that exterior insulation is vapor open in this case. We put some rock wool on there, right? So everything's basically the same where the back side of that sheathing is the least permeable part of our wall assembly. But if you look down at the temperature scale at the bottom, because we've added that exterior insulation, we're now keeping that sheathing warmer. That insulation is a nice sweater we just put on the outside of that sheathing. It's keeping it warmer as our water vapor backs up through that least permeable part of our assembly on the back side of that sheathing, it's not going to condense because it's not at the dew point. The dew point, the cold part is now further out. We've warmed up our vapor control layer. And this is really important. And one of the really great uh, reasons why we wanna be using exterior insulation, especially on high performance, low load homes where they don't have a lot of energy. Uh, in them to dry things out, right? So, so how did a cold level wall work? We've been building cold level walls with two by six and sheathing, and you know, for you know, fifty years now. And my house is still standing. It's a nineteen twenty five Craftsman. It's still here. Well, the reason it's still working is because we're putting sixty thousand, eighty thousand, hundred thousand BTU furnaces inside of these houses, and they're that energy is keeping the sheathing warm and keeping that condensation from happening. We're drying these things out as if our houses are kilns, right? With these giant 100,000 BTU furnaces in them. As we're starting to build, uh, say, passive house level homes, we built one back in 2018 that only needed 3,750 BTUs to keep it warm on the, on the coldest day of the year. Um, compared to most houses that have 60,000 BTUs, right? So the reason our old cold level walls worked is because we were drying them out through sheer force, right? And so as we're driving down our energy usage within our homes, which we need to do to address climate change uh, and lower energy bills and all those five reasons, six reasons we gave earlier, um, we really have to pay attention to that and we're not inadvertently causing damage to our walls, right? And this is where exterior insulation really makes a difference. So uh, that's it for vapor. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about bulk water. So this is uh, water in its um, liquid state. And you know the biggest problem with bulk water is leaks because leaks let water into your assemblies and cause rot and, and durability issues, right? And so in order for bulk water to be a problem, you have to have four things happening. You have to have a source of water, right? It has to be raining. It has to have water on the ground. There has to be, a, uh, I don't know, a, a broken hose bib. We have to have water. Um, the next thing we have to have is a pathway for that water to travel, right? We need to have a hole, right? We need to have some way for the water that's there to get in. If it can't get in, then who cares if there's water there, right? Um, then we need a driving force pushing the water along that pathway. Now, that could be gravity. Remember, we talked about that, that, you know, um, first laws that we talked about. It could be a pressure difference. Maybe there's wind happening on the outside or something like that. Or maybe you've got your bath fan on and your kitchen hood vent and your dryer going and they're pumping a ton of air out of your house and it's sucking the water into your house through that pathway. Um, you need a driving force. It could be hydrostatic pressure. There's a bunch of different driving forces that can happen. And then we need something for that water to damage, right? So certain things like say, siding with a rain screen with the WRB behind it, maybe we've got a hole and a pathway and a driving force, but once it gets back there, it's not gonna hurt anything, right? Like we need something for that water to damage, typically like a wood or an organic material. If it's something like concrete or plastic, uh, water is not gonna harm concrete or plastic. You're not gonna degrade the concrete. You're not gonna degrade that plastic, right? So. These are things we want to think about when we're talking about bulk water. 
So with that in mind, uh, exterior insulation um, has these two characteristics. Um, it can either be hydrophilic, which means that it's, you know, the Greek for love and water, right? It loves water, it's hydrophilic, or it's hydrophobic, right? Um, it doesn't like water. So I got the example of dipping, uh, you know, a paper towel in water for the hydrophilic or like water off a duck's back, right? Um, so something like a wood fiberboard insulation, um, a paper faced or a fiberglass faced polyiso, um, really low density uh, EPS and uh, rigid fiberglass insulation, which exists, it's never a common. Um, these things are all hydrophilic. They're gonna take water on, right? Um, and there's a time and a place for these things. Um, other insulations are gonna be hydrophobic. They're gonna shed water. So graphite impregnated EPS, that GPS insulation, again, I've got that asterisk there because if it's a, a low density, it can also bring some water into it. Uh, not a ton, but it can bring some. Um, extruded polystyrene, so the XPS sheds water. Um, Foil-faced polyiso, right? That foil, that metal is gonna shed water. Um, cork is hydrophobic. Water doesn't get sucked into cork. Think about your wine bottles, right? You don't get, they don't get soggy full of wine, right? They, they, they're hydrophobic. Uh, and then mineral wool, rock wool is also hydrophobic. So other things to consider when you're choosing or considering exterior insulation is uh, the compressive strength, right? And this is, this is the ability of a material to be compressed or deformed under pressure, kind of like walking on a beach. Um, and this is rated in pounds per square inch. Um, and I've got a picture of some rock wool here. Uh, rock wool has a relatively um, low pounds per square inch. I think it's about 11 pounds per square inch. Um, so it can uh, be squished in, right? So as you're screwing in those battens, you can potentially get wavy siding installs. You don't want to do that if you're building a custom house for a client or something like that, or, you're on your, or your own house, right? So as we're considering different insulations, we want to think about their compressivity. Something like a cork, something like a, um, you know, an XPS insulation, um, those tend to have really high uh, compressive strengths, they'll go up to 25 PSI or sometimes higher. Um, and those are really hard. You can't really like divot those things very well. So you want to think about this as you're choosing your exterior insulation product for your building. Um, another characteristic of these materials is um, air tightness, right? So as you remember, the second most important thing we can do on our homes after keeping bulk water out is dealing with our air leakage, right? So can exterior insulation be used as your air barrier? Well, some, yeah, it could, you know. Some insulations, um, you know, for instance, I've got some XPS insulation right here. Um, if I try to blow through this, I, I can't blow through it, it's airtight. Right. Um, there's other insulations like, say, a cork or a mineral wool that if you blow through it, air passes through it. That's not an air barrier. Right. So certain insulations are air barriers. Certain insulations are not. Um, what I'll say about the air barrier, though, is um, it's just one component. It, an air barrier is really is an assembly of parts. Right. So even though we're putting this on the exterior wall, how are we connecting that air barrier into our foundation? How are we getting it under that bottom plate? As we're at the top plate, how are we getting that exterior insulation, if we're using that for air barrier, to connect to our air barrier into the building or over the top of the building, right? So they can be used as air barriers. We typically at our company don't use them, nor do I recommend using them as an air barrier um, because I think that they're not... Um, there are other products that can be used more successfully and be more durable that it can be more cost effective in the install and um, we'll get to some of that later but um, suffice it to say one certainly can use these as an air barrier um, but make sure that you're paying to attention to that whole system um, another issue with these things is how the heck do you stick them to the wall right you frame your wall you put on your wrb now you got to put this stuff on. And sometimes you can get up some really thick, um, you know, if you get into some cold climates, they're putting four inches, six inches, eight inches or more of exterior insulation on. And you have to be able to attach these things. And so 
you know, oftentimes there's long screws that are used, right? Um, those can get expensive, right? If you're using a rock wool, you want to make sure you're not compressing those things in or out, right? Um, there are uh, long nails. Here's a, on the bottom right, we got a picture of a, one of our Bostich guns uh, that shoots up to five and a half inch nails, right? This is a timber framing gun. And in this picture, we're shooting through, you know, a cross hatched rain screen through an inch and a half of insulation into our sheathing and into our um, framing members. And that actually is a really cost effective and quick way to do it. Want to make sure your engineer calcs that out for you. Um, there are things like the Cascadia clips, which are these fiberglass offsets that hold a rail and you can put your insulation back behind it and hold it off of the wall. Um, and then there's things like Z girts, which are typically metal um, Zs that you, you screw through the bottom side into the wall and then you attach your cladding to the, you know, the part labeled B right there. Um, and then you put your exterior insulation in between that. Um, highly recommend not using metal Z girts that will cause a ton of thermal bridging and really degrade the overall R value of your wall. They do make some of these in fiberglass. Uh, Cascadia makes them, check that out. Um, unfortunately, I see, especially in a lot of multifamily and commercial building, a lot of metal Z girts it's almost taking out, it's taking out more than half of the benefit of the R value of your exterior insulation through that thermal conduction of the metal Z gird. So whenever I'm driving down Division Street, there's a couple of buildings that, I'm, that are being built right now. And it's like, hmm, just such a bummer to see these things being used, but they're easy. So a lot of people use them. Um, here's a picture of us just kind of screwing our battens through some rock wool right here with some screws. Um, if I go back here for a second, there's this Hico Topix um, stainless steel screw. This one's interesting because you can screw it in. It's got threading that's exactly the same uh, tightness on near the head as it is near the point. And as you screw it in, you can back it up or drive it forward and it'll move your batten back and forth so that you can actually, if you get waviness, just go through and move it in or out, right? Really cool product. It's made specifically for exterior insulation, um, quite expensive. So um, if you look into that, you might want to use it, um, you know, only where you need it. <laughs> so moving along, the, the next thing we're going to talk about are the uh, four control layers here. Um, so again, bulk water, air, vapor, and thermal. And uh, I'm going to give some examples here in the next couple slides and just kind of point out where these things are. Uh, this is a big complicated image to the right here. But suffice it to say, when we were designing this, we had to think about where's our bulk water barrier, what control layer, where's our, where's our air barrier, where's our vapor control layer in this assembly, where are we gonna have that least permeable spot in this assembly, and where's our thermal um, barrier. So uh, on the bottom left here, uh, we've got some zip system sheathing and some cork exterior insulation. This is on a two by six wall filled with cellulose. I know this, this was on a house we built back in 2014, I think. And on this one, our number one, our bulk water, um, it's not the cork, even though it's hydrophobic, uh, but water will go through it. And so our primary bulk water um, control layer is the zip system sheathing in this one, right? Um, on this one, the air barrier is also our zip system sheathing. And again, it's a component, right? So it's the zip system sheathing plus that pink stuff, which is a, a Persoco joint and seam. It's an um, air sealing product. Um, and that joint and seam plus the zip system is what's controlling our continuous air um, layer right there, uh, air barrier. Um, Where is the least vapor permeable part of this assembly? Well, it's that zip system sheathing is on the interior side of that zip system sheathing. It's the least permeable part. And our thermal boundary is the obviously the exterior cork insulation, along with uh, the zip system sheathing, because it does have an R value, and that insulation inside those walls, it's cellulose, right? So that all those together is a thermal boundary. On the right, we've got uh, a different scenario where the air barrier is on the plywood where we've taped the seams with the Sega Wiglove product. And that's our air barrier. The bulk water control layer though is WRB, which is mechanically attached on the outside here. Now, the reason that we put it on the outside is because we're using a wood fiberboard insulation here. Now, 
even though a lot of the manufacturers will tell you that this does shed water and if you put water on it, it will shed off. Um, it's hydro, water is hydrophilic, uh, loves water. I don't trust over the long time to leave that exposed, right? So we're gonna put our bulk water barrier to the outside of that and protect it from bulk water, which is different than the one on the left, right? Because on the one on the left, our bulk water is behind our exterior insulation. And this one on the right, it's in front of our exterior insulation because we're trying to keep that bulk water from getting absorbed into that wood fiber insulation. Um, so air barrier at the sheathing, then we've got our thermal control layer is at the um, wood fiber insulation. This one's called Styco. Um, and then we've got cellulose or fiberglass, blown fiberglass in the walls in the project on the right. And our vapor control layer is the least permeable part uh, is the plywood again. The plywood is going to be somewhere between one and three perms. And that Sega My Vest is going to be somewhere around 25 or something like that, right? So here's some other examples on the bottom left. This is a project we did where we got a GPS exterior insulation over a zip system sheathing. Um, so in this particular one, our bulk water control layer is again, the zip system sheathing, but it's also the GPS insulation because water won't go into that GPS exterior insulation. And as you can see here underneath that window bucket under the flashing, you can see a little white piece of tape that says Wiglove there. That's protecting our rough opening. So if water gets behind our window and our sill pan somehow, which over time it's likely to do, it will run out onto that tape and then onto that GPS insulation. And that is acting as our bulk water control layer. It's our secondary bulk water control layer. Our primary one is the zip system sheathing, right? Uh, in this case, the air barrier is the zip system sheathing taped with the Sega Wiglove product. Um, vapor control layer is the backside of that OSB again. And our thermal boundary is the exterior insulation along with the uh, cellulose on the inside of this wall. Um, on the right, a different assembly. And I'm showing you a whole bunch of different assemblies and talking about all these different control layers because it's going to be up to you to decide, hey, where is our bulk water control? Where is our vapor control? Because do we want to use uh, an exterior insulation that's compressive or has a good fire aspect to it or is hydrophobic? You, There is no one size fits all. This is the solution. You need to know the concepts behind this in order to choose the material that you're going to use in, in a particular situation, right? And we'll get into some of the other aspects of um, exterior insulation as to why you might choose one over another. Um, on the right, we've got a self-adhered membrane. Um, and this is um, Zero Energy Home we built a couple years back where it's a, a Sega My Vest self-adhered uh, membrane that sticks to the plywood in this case. And then we've got a rock wool um, exterior insulation. So our bulk water um, is going to be that Sega WRB, self-adhered WRB, because water will go through um, that rock wall. If you take a, a glass of water and you pour it through some rock wall, it will drip through it, right? Um, so that's our primary bulk water control. It's also our air barrier in this case. Uh, we did not tape the seams of the plywood on this because the self-adhered membrane covers that all up, and that's our air barrier too. Um, in this case, the vapor control layer is not that WRB, rather it's the plywood. That WRB, again, is gonna have a perm rating of maybe 25, it's vapor open. Um, whereas the plywood might be more in the, you know, kind of two to eight perm range. And so that's gonna be the least permeable part. And then our thermal control layer is obviously, in this case, we use the cellulose insulation on the inside and then the rock wall on the outside. So, um, one thing you're going to want to use on with exterior insulation are rain screens. You want to use this in any building. I highly, highly recommend putting fully uh, gapped rain screens uh, on all of your projects. Uh, these are some pictures of them right here. On the left, we've got some wood battens going over some cork insulation. On the bottom of that picture, you can see the screen. It's not super easy to, to see, but there is some um, fiberglass screening that we've got going from behind the exterior insulation that'll go up over those battens. And that's a, a, a bug insect screen so that critters don't get in there. Um, that's also happening on the top. You can see that on the top there too, there's some of that screen being hung over so bugs don't get in there. Um, 
On the bottom right, there's a product called uh, Coravent. It's got like a felt um, screen on the bottom. Same purpose, um, it's to keep bugs out, right? And you wanna make sure that you're connecting these things from the top to the bottom uh, so that air can travel freely through there. You wanna make sure that you're allowing air out at the bottom of punched openings, windows, doors, um, any uh, fixture blocks or anything, lights, things like that, that you're gonna put onto your walls, All right? Um, here's some more pictures of some rain screens. Um, again, some cork insulation on the left um, with a zip system sheathing behind it. Um, on the right, uh, we've got uh, the GPS insulation with a rain screen and then some fiber cement siding on the outside of that. In this particular image, you can kind of see it all come together right there where our bulk water control from that previous slide is gonna go out over that GPS insulation as our secondary bulk water control. Um, our primary bulk water control is the behind that EPS on the zip system. Um, the rain screen battens are holding that insulation in with our screwed in fasteners. That GPS is not very compressive. So that's why we, part of the reasons why we chose it on this product project. Uh, and then you can see the rain screen, those gaps behind the siding there, which is causing all those uh, hydrostatic forces to not drive water into our building and also allowing that siding to dry. Um, in this case, we use the GPS insulation because it's relatively affordable compared to rock wool or cork or wood fiber. Um, and this was a project where the clients were really paying attention to cost. Um, this was a certified FIAS Passivals project that we did back in 2017 or 18. So um, again, penetrations and fi fixture blocks. Uh, you can see the electrical meter on the top left there. We just attach it to our battens. That'll get flashed to the battens and then siding around it. Um, install your rain screens. You know, there's a fi fixture block on the bottom left there. Um, and on the right, you see a, a little whip of electrical wire coming out there. That's air sealed, taped um, to the air barrier, the zip system right there and then uh, punches through the cork, and then we'll install our rain screen battens, and then we'll install a fixture block um, in the same plane as those battens, and then we'll install our fixture to that, and then side up to it. So window and door install. Um, I realize we're coming up against one o'clock. Um, I'll be here till 1.30. Um, I'll try to move things along here. Um, this can be tricky. Um, First thing you're gonna to wanna to fig, uh, figure out is are we doing a flanged window or are we doing a non-flanged window, right? A flangeless install. On the right, you can see there's a, a flangeless window with clips. That's how you screw those things in. On the left, we've got a more typical um, flange window. And so as you're choosing your exterior insulation product, you to figure out, well, you know, gosh, how are we gonna install our windows and doors, right? And so one way to do it is to use a window buck. Um, and so this is a, a detail of it. And here you can see all these different in red. We've got our air control layer drawn out. Our bulk water control layer is drawn out. Our vapor control layer is in green. And then our thermal control layer is in yellow, right? I'm gonna scooch ahead a slide here because this kind of shows it a little bit better. Uh, what we've done is we've just taken a scrap of plywood and installed it into the rough opening of that uh, window. And then uh, set our window, and this is a flangeless window, which gets screwed in, in this case, through the window frame, but it could be with clips, right, um, into that buck. And that buck comes out to the same plane as the edge of that exterior insulation. So that way allows us to install our rain screen battens and our trim uh, in that window, right? So that buck is basically extending the thickness of that wall out to the plane of that exterior insulation and then allowing us to install our flangeless window inside that buck while continuing our air control layer, our vapor control layer, bulk water, all those kinds of things. So here's a, a picture of that um, in real life. You can see that green zip system is part of our window buck that we installed. The window got set in there. Uh, we've taped the seams to continue our air barrier. Um, and then there's a, a metal pan that got tucked in underneath that window for our bulk water control at the bottom. And at the top, there's a metal flashing that's um, going over that buck. And then our, our trim, you know, if we go back here, this uh, the trim that bumps up against the window is then going to sit uh, up against that buck in there and butt up against the back of that window. And then we install our siding uh, to that piece of trim. All right. 
So it's actually pretty easy and once, once you've done this. Um, it's not super complicated. Um, I tend to think the flangeless window installs are easier um, for exterior installation projects, but um, if you are going with the flanged window, uh, a good option is using this product, which is called Thermal Buck. Um, it's available, you can call it PAR and they will order it for you. You can also go to the website, which I've got a link to right here. Um, what this is, is you take your rough opening and you uh, line all four sides with this product, which is basically a really rigid foam that's got uh, a WRB or a water resistive uh, layer around the outside of it. And it's structural, it's really rigid. And so what you do is you install this into your rough opening and it breaks that thermal bridge and it comes out to the same plane as your exterior insulation or as what they've done here is they've brought it out to match not just the exterior insulation but also the rain screen battens here. And so that's all in the same plane and that allows them to then install the flanged window into this thermal buck. Um, you do have to get fasteners that will go all the way through the thermal buck and into your wood framing. Um, you can't just install it into the thermal buck. Um, so you're just using a longer nail or a longer screw through this. And this makes it pretty easy um, to detail your windows in a more traditional way where you have a flanged window that's sitting to the outside of your wall assembly. So if it's your first time doing it or you're not um, used to installing flangeless windows, this is a really great product that can make the install pretty easy. Um, and I highly recommend checking this out, especially, like I said, if it's one of your first exterior insulation installs. Um, here's a section of this here. So the, the thermal buck, if you look on the right, um, you can see it where it's kind of cross hatched in there at the top of the window head. Um, it's in the same plane as our exterior insulation. In this case, it's a wood fiber board insulation. And that blue line is our WRB again, because it's hydrophilic. We want to get the bulk water barrier to the outside, which works really nicely with the thermal buck. You just continue our WRB right down, right over that thermal buck, right over that window flange, right? Um, our air barrier is in red, so it's cruising down behind the uh, exterior insulation, um, and then it hits that thermal buck, and it goes to the outside of that, and then connects to the window on down at the bottom condition, again, to the window, to the thermal buck, and then the thermal buck down to the sheathing. That's our continuous air barrier. So um, really good option uh, to check out with the um, flanged windows. So um, here's an, a third example. Now there's 20, no, there's more than 20. There's a hundred perfectly great ways to install flanged windows, flangeless windows with different types of exterior insulation, with bucks, with thermal bucks, with different trim styles, modern trim, craftsman trim. There's no way I could possibly show you every one of these things. So again, I'm just giving you another example. You're gonna to have to use these concepts, those four control layers and think about what do we wanna use for our particular product or project. In this case, the clients wanted a um, kind of a traditional um, head casing. And so we didn't wanna make that all out of wood because that would be a giant thermal bridge. And so you can see that we um, cut some cork Nice thing about cork is that you can actually set your saw blade to an angle. We cut that at you know 15 degrees or 11 degrees um, at the top and put that over the top of the window. In this case, it was a um, flangeless window. And then we were able to put our flashing over the top of that and then install our wood traditional casing over that cork. And that's what gave us our thermal break. And then over the top of that metal flashing on the top, and we continued our cork insulation over the top of that along with our uh, bug screen. You can kind of see the uh, screen on that top right image above the flashing kind of hanging out there. That's gonna get flapped over our rain screen to keep bugs and stuff from getting into that cavity right there. So I realize I'm cruising through this pretty quickly. Um, again, these details are gonna be available. Um, Allie, I know we're getting on to one o'clock. I've just got a, two more slides. So. These are, um, this is a great chart to check out that I put together uh, this past week. Talk about putting this all together, right? And things we didn't talk about is certain, um, is embodied carbon. Certain products of exterior insulation have really high embodied carbon. For instance, rock wool, because it's made in giant blast furnaces that use tons of fossil fuels and high energy to create rock wool. 
it's got a lot of embodied carbon in it. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, something like cork. Cork sequesters more carbon in its growth cycle than it does through the harvesting, processing, shipping, and installation of it, right? So it's actually a sequestering product. Um, other things live in different levels, right? So this is something you want to pay attention to. Uh, exposure, how long can you leave this material on your wall before it turns into a taco or uh, starts breaking down? Something to consider. Um, something we touched on is fire resistance with all the wildfires that are happening now. Um, you may want to consider something with a really high class A fire resistance. Um, mineral fiber, rock wool is one that comes to mind, obviously. Interestingly, cork is also a class A. Same as stainless steel, fire rating. Um, and the foams are typically a class C, they, they burn. Um, you wanna think about what do these things cost? Um, when you look at this chart, and in my opinion, the best exterior insulation there is, period, is cork. Because it, it has, you know, it's not very, it's super rigid, it's hydrophobic, um, you know, it's a sequestering carbon. You can leave it exposed for greater than a year without degradation. It doesn't have thermal drift, class A fire rating, you know, What's the problem? Why wouldn't you use this all the time? Well, it's also the most expensive thing you can buy, right? So um, there's always that budgetary cost that you got to bring into the, the, the thought, right? So, and is it available? Uh, right now, we're building a couple projects where uh, they're in wildfire zones and the clients want to use rock wool, but we can't get it. It's not available right now. No one can get it. Um, hopefully that'll change, but luckily we can't get cork and because they're in wildfire, they basically, the clients were like, we don't really have a choice. We're gonna spend more on exterior insulation. Um, but that was the most important thing about it was the fire rating. So we went with cork, which for me was a win because it wins for all these other reasons too. So, um, you know, last slide, this is, uh, I'm not gonna be able to tell you exactly what to use or what products, things like that. There's some examples that I've shared here, um, but you're gonna have to find the shoe that fits. You're gonna have to find the things that work for you and uh, use these concepts to decide which insulation is gonna work best for you. So with that, um, I'll hand it back to Allie here. And Allie's job, uh, Josh, thank you so much. And, you know, as mentioned, you gotta find the, you know, the materials that fit your project. And there's no greater place to do that than the Sustainable Homes Professional Course. Next slide. We've been offering SHP and accreditations for over the past 10 years, and it's really helped builders take their project and sustainability to the next level. Um, we are now very pleased to offer SHP online and on demand, and to understand the advancement of that, it traditionally used to be a uh, 12 full all day session spread over six months. So it was quite an undertaking. And we were also really limited because it was in person uh, where we can offer it as well. Next slide. Now, anyone can access the course regardless of your location. It consists of 15 hours of core content with features such as professionally held site visits, product demos, Josh mentioned several of them here today, uh, but also last year's on the level series. And then you also get one-on-one -on -one live sessions with the instructors uh, as part of our fill in the gap offering as well. Next slide. So SHP being one of the most comprehensive uh, programs uh, does have uh, a registration fee that associated, but you know, depending on who you are and how you build, we do have discounts available as well as a group discount for groups of two or more. Go ahead, next slide. 